administration. When Reagan administration economic policy had pushed the value of the dollar and pushed the real exchange rate e up to levels that it had never been seen before. And so it looked for a while as though the US dollar might go to parity with the pound sterling. That one dollar would be equal to one pound sterling, which you know, has never been the case before and has never been the case since, and we'll probably never see again the way things are going. And so when we hit England, we were kind of very poor graduate students. Um, we were living in, um, so I think of it as a peace and conflicts house, a uh, study house, the Quaker International Peacemaking Center in Russell Square uh, in central London near the British Museum. Uh, marvelous place to spend the summer, uh, wonderful place to do. When a dollar buys you a pound sterling, it seems like all of London is 50% off, and everything in London is much cheaper than it is in the United States, and we had an absolute blast. Uh, ever since then, when we've gone back, the exchange rate's been much less favorable, and we've had a much less good time, even though we're far richer now. Right? Back then, it seemed everything was an amazing bargain, and isn't it wonderful how you can get this experience so cheaply? Now it's, they want fifteen ninety five for a shrimp sandwich, once we translate it into dollars. Um, that's why exports are determined by the real exchange rate. Um, make things expensive because the value of your currency goes up and people won't buy very many of them um, at all. Um, so exports are determined by foreigners' incomes and the real exchange rate. Now let's back up to business investment spending. And as we said, we were going to have a term that depends on business confidence. Do they think the economy is going to recover quickly? Um, do they think that if they invest in the United States, somehow inflation is going to burst out and that inflation is going to make it much more difficult for them to figure out how to make profits within the range of the price system? Um, will the government swing far to the left in 20 years and impose confiscatory taxes on corporate profits? Um, so their investment will turn out to be worthless. Um, or will the country simply collapse in 15 or 20 years? and looters come and take your stuff. Um, all these things are things that influence business confidence. Um, businesses tend to like stability. Um, they tend to like stable and low taxes. They tend to like social order. Um, they tend to like lots of demand. They tend to like predictability. That's one component of business investment spending. Uh, but this term also includes what John Maynard Keynes calls the animal spirits um, of businessmen, and he said men, because back then it really was almost all men, uh, how people get exuberantly optimistic or depressed. Um, besides from this confidence term, there's also this second term, um, that investment spending depends on the sensitivity of investment spending to the interest rate um, times the interest rate. Um, a higher interest rate means lower investment spending. Why? Um, because the higher the interest rate are, the higher is the expected hurdle an investment project must clear for it to be profitable. You take a new factory to a business investment committee when the interest rate is 10% per year, and you say in 10 years we'll be hitting our stride with this factory and it'll be churning out the product like you won't believe, and someone will raise their hand and say, but at 10% interest, um, at 10% interest, for each dollar we borrow now, we'll have to pay back $2.60 10 years from now. That's extremely steep. While if the interest rate were down at 1%, for each dollar we borrow now, we only have to pay back $1.10 in 10 years. Um, at a lower interest rate, an awful lot of new factories look highly profitable. At a high interest rate, relatively few new factories look highly profitable. Businesses that are even half aware of you know, financial realities will invest a lot more when interest rates are low um, when they are, when they're high. Um, so here we have our business investment spending. Um, three terms, important, on the sensitivity of business investment to the interest rate, the change in the interest rate, and the change in business and investor confidence as well. Those are pretty much the same thing. Businessmen and women are investors. Investors are businessmen and women. It's rarely that Wall Street thinks one thing and corporate America thinks the other. Um, real exchange rate. Um, the real exchange rate is determined by confidence in the long-run value of the currency and the difference in interest rate between home and abroad. Um, this balance between fear, optimism, and greed. Um, optimism is what you think the interest rate is going to be over the long run. Greed is that if you invest your money in a place where the interest rate is currently high, you get lots of interest on it, and that's nice. Fear. If the exchange rate is high relative to historical value averages or to fundamental values, there's a chance it's going to come back to earth very quickly. And what good is it collecting an extra 3% per year by investing in a high interest rate jurisdiction for five years if after the end of those five years the exchange rate falls by 50%? Um, then you've made 15% and lost 50 or 35% behind. Um, that people will be willing to bid up the value of the dollar if interest rates in the United States are high, but they won't be willing to bid it up too much. And this balance between fear and greed, given the existing level of optimism, is determined by the value of this parameter here, epsilon sub r, the sensitivity of the value of home currency to changes in interest rates. Um, determinants of exports. Um, exports are determined by foreigners' incomes y. Um, say they're a flat percentage of foreigners' incomes y. And by the value of the home currency, by the value of the real exchange rate. When foreign incomes go up, our exports go up. When the cost to foreigners of the stuff we make, um, when the value of home currency goes up, exports go down. Um, so we can then take our equation for exports, and we can take our exchange rate equation, and we can substitute in um, to get a bunch of terms um, for what determines exports. Um, first of all, exports are going to be a function of foreign incomes. Um, when foreign incomes go up, our exports go up. And this tells us by how about by how much. This was why when the US financial crisis hit in late 2008, over on the other side of Asia, there were all of a sudden lots of huddles of economic policymakers in Asia who were saying, wait a minute, it looks like the United States is going to do a deep recession. Um, for us, the United States are the foreigners. How low are their incomes going to fall? And what will this do to our exports? We need to devise alternative economic policies to deal with this forthcoming crunch, which they have done magnificently. But when at the start of 2009, I went to Singapore, um, and you could go out and you could look south at the Strait of Malacca, and you could see an extraordinarily large part of the world's container ship fleet just riding at anchor empty, because the United States was no longer buying at the pace it had been buying six months before. And so it was no use filling those ships with things and sending them across the Pacific Ocean to Long Beach and Oakland. Um, so that's one term. Um, exports depend on foreign incomes. Uh, and exports depend negatively on speculator optimism. Um, that is, when speculators are optimistic about the value of the home currency, and they are eager to invest in dollars, and they pour into dollars, and they buy lots of dollars, and they push the value of the dollar up, well, that makes home-produced goods more expensive to foreigners and pushes exports down by this amount x sub epsilon, the sensitivity of exports onto the exchange rate. This is especially important right now because the biggest of the speculators in foreign exchange markets right now is the People's Bank of China. Right? The People's Bank of China loves the dollar. Now, the People's Bank of China is soon going to have $3 trillion invested in dollar-denominated securities. Each month, the People's Bank of China shows up and says, we love the dollar so much that we're willing to invest another 30 or $40 billion in adding to our holdings of dollar-denominated securities. Um, that pushes the value of the dollar up because they're so optimistic about its future. And that pushes United States exports down. And at a time like right now, when the unemployment rate is high and when aggregate demand is low, that downward pressure on gross exports is not something that's terribly welcome uh, for the US economy right now. 
Um, why is the People's Bank of China so optimistic about the future of the dollar? Um, well, they're not really. They're just acting as though they are. Um, it's the policy of the government of China to try to keep the value um, of the renminbi, the value of the yuan and yuan in terms of dollars, low, um, which means the People's Bank of China has been told to act as though you're really optimistic in order to keep the dollar from declining and the renminbi from appreciating against it. And we'll figure out what to do with all these dollars we own um, later, sometime later on, when we're richer, when we've industrialized, when the world economy has changed its configuration. Um, this is the biggest speculation-driven move in exchange rates we've ever seen, um, though it's not quite driven by market sentiment, it's driven by government sentiment. And it's an important thing for you to watch out for, at least over the next 10 years, possibly for significantly longer. The third thing uh, that influences is what foreign central banks are doing with their monetary policies. Uh, when foreigners raise interest rates abroad, that tends to push the values of their currencies up, which means it pushes the value of our currency down. That means that the value of the home currency falls, which means our goods become cheaper to foreigners, which means that our exports um, go up. Tight monetary policy, um, tight monetary policy abroad, raising interest rates abroad, gives a boost to production um, and demand here. Um, and fourth and last, tight monetary policy here. If we raise interest rates, um, if we raise interest rates, then that's going to push the value of the home currency up and put downward pressure on our exports. And that was what was going on in 1983, 84, and 85 um, that made my wife's and my first trip to London um, such an absolute blast. Now, the Reagan administration had um, greatly overestimated, at the least, its ability to get Congress to agree to spending cuts, uh, and had underestimated its ability to get Congress to agree to tax cuts. So in the early 1980s, you had this huge government budget deficit, these large increases in spending uh, as Reagan started the second Cold War on the military, et cetera, et cetera, accompanied with tax cuts that together put strong upward pressure on aggregate demand. The Federal Reserve under Paul Volcker said, wait a minute, this is going too far. We don't want aggregate demand to be so high that the economy can't produce uh, in order to meet it without significant inflation. We need to do something to decrease aggregate demand. We're going to push up interest rates. And they did. And they're pushing up interest rates, pushed up the value of the dollar, and pushed our exports uh, down. Um, significantly, but gave us a fun summer in London. Um, that is partial recompense um, for us. Those are the determinants of exports. Um, so now let's see how much of that's still running around, wandering around in your brains, and how much of it is found at home. Um, why is it that the value of the home currency comes higher right, whenever interest uh, rates um, become higher as well? Um, what's going on here? What's the chain of logic which links interest rates at home to the value of the exchange rate? Yep, we're going to want A. Um, we definitely want A. Um, when people see that they can um, earn higher interest rates or earn higher returns on their money by shifting their money from foreign denominated bonds to home denominated bonds, this pushes up demand for dollar denominated securities and so pushes up the value of the dollar. Um, B is wrong um, because when the value of the home currency is higher, um, people actually fear a decline in the home currency more. Um, and C is wrong because you've gotten confused about what the exchange rate means. Um, that in this course, at least, the exchange rate is the value of the home currency, and that exchange rate goes up when interest rates um, go up. Um, and D is wrong too. When home interest rates are high, dollars aren't plentiful in foreign markets. Rather, they're relatively scarce because lots of people are holding on to dollar-denominated securities because they're paying relatively high interest rates. Um, we'll do better next time. Uh, next time I ask this question, I'm sure it'll be a lot higher than 52% uh, for the right answer. Um, now let's regroup and go back to our autonomous spending uh, once again. Uh, we had an equation for autonomous spending. We then had produced other equations for the investment and the gross exports terms. We simply throw those in to our equation for autonomous spending. We replace the change in investment by the consumer confidence investment term and by the change in interest rates investment term. We replace the exports by its four terms, the foreign incomes term, the speculator term, the foreign interest rates term, and the domestic rates return. Um, and we then look at what our autonomous spending is. We see that the terms fall into four groups. First, there's a term that depends on foreigners that I put third here. What's happening to foreign incomes? What's happening to foreign interest rates? Those affect the level of spending here at home, and this third line here is how they do so. Second, there are the confidence terms, uh, the terms that depend on what view people take of the future, whether they're irrationally exuberant or irrationally pessimistic, whatever. Um, there's consumer confidence, how much households are willing to boost or to spend on consumer goods because they feel well or scared about the future. There's business investor committee confidence, business confidence in here as well. Um, you know, if you go into the Obama White House from, say, June 2009 on up until he resigned his post in August 2010, um, you would find my friend Peter Orzag, who used to teach here, um, saying that, who was then director of the Office of Management and Budget, um, Peter would be saying, look, we're not going to get the Federal Reserve to cut interest rates a lot more. Look, we're not going to get Congress to pass another big burst of government spending to provide another fiscal stimulus to the economy. If unemployment is going to fall, if production is going to rise in the near term, it will be because we restore consumer and household confidence. And an aggressive, bold plan to try to tackle the long-run federal deficit and put the long-run finances of the U.S. government on a stable and sustainable path is the best thing we can do to increase consumer um, and investor confidence. Um, powerful argument. I think the arguments on the other side were a little bit stronger. Whatever he didn't carry the day, uh, that's what he was thinking about. That there are all these terms that affect autonomous spending that depend upon confidence, and to restore business confidence and consumer confidence is a good way to deal with an economic downturn. Um, of course, Herbert Hoover thought this too, which was why you get the quotes of Herbert Hoover apocryphally saying, well, productivity is just around the corner, never mind the Great Depression outside the window, uh, which didn't do Hoover's long-run reputation any good. Um, the third of the confidence terms, as I said before, is foreign exchange speculator confidence in the dollar term. And it's actually somewhat of a misnomer to call it a confidence term, because it's not just that there's this effect on autonomous spending coming when foreign exchange speculators are optimistic or pessimistic. Um, you've got to count foreign central banks and their willingness to buy or their desire to sell dollar-denominated securities to act like speculators in there as well. Um, so the next time through, I'm probably going to call this a speculator confidence and exchange rate intervention. Um, so those are the two parts of the economic environment. Um, there also are the two terms that depend on economic policy. Um, government purchases, fiscal policy. How much is the government spending? How much is it going out of the market and saying, we want to buy stuff, please sell it to us. And then there's this term down here, which depends on interest rates, uh, which are affected or controlled by the Federal Reserve. Um, the sensitivity to interest rates of business investor spending, investment spending, and of gross exports. Um, how sensitive investment spending is to the interest rate, and then plus how sensitive the exchange rate is to changes in the interest rate, times how sensitive exports are to changes in the exchange rate. Um, 
Those give us our four terms of autonomous spending, um, fiscal policy, confidence, foreigners, um, and then the interest sensitive components multiplied by the change in the interest rate, which is affected by the Federal Reserve, but changes in financial markets without the Federal Reserve doing anything can also affect interest rates as well. Um, and then we take that kind of expression for this autonomous spending back to our investment savings equation. Um, and we can write a different um, investment savings equation. Um, we can write an investment savings equation that has our multiplier terms, um, our denominator in our standard um, income expenditure equation times the change in government spending. Uh, that's fiscal policy. Um, that's the effect of government purchases on the level of real GDP. Um, those are the terms that Christina Romer were frantically calculating in November and December of 2008 when she left Berkeley uh, and kind of left our spring 2009 economic teaching schedule in ruins. Um, then there are the monetary policy terms. Um, the interest sensitivity of exports and of investment spending, uh, the multiplier terms in the denominator, because if investment spending goes up, well, then incomes are going to go up. And if incomes go up, consumption spending is going to go up. And so incomes are going to go up even more, that your initial boost to investment spending is going to be multiplied by these terms um, times the change in interest rates, um, financial markets um, plus monetary policy, and then all the other economic environment terms, the confidence terms and the foreigner terms, um, go up here. And remember what this baseline autonomous spending kind of confidence in foreigners um, level was. Um, you know, um, that's the equation um, that we're going to want to use alongside our income expenditure equation. That's our investment savings equation. Um, let's try it out. Um, once again, right. um, only um, only 30 seconds. And these numbers are all in trillions, so your answer should probably be a zero point something. Um, what's going to happen um, if the Federal Reserve and financial markets together cut the long-term real risk interest rate by 2% with no other changes in the economic environment or in fiscal policy? What's going to happen to real GDP? Um, and people seem to be evenly split between B and C. Um, and let me see if I can calculate it in my head. I'll um, try to go to the next slide. Um, once again, we have our denominator of 1 minus 0.6 plus 0.1 of 0.5. So we're going to have a multiplier term of 2. Um, we have interest rates um, down by 2 percentage points. That's probably 0.02. Um, these terms up at the top, these terms at the top multiply together to be 20, so we have 20 times 0.02, um, which gives us 0.4. We have two minuses, the minus out here and the minus in front of interest rates because they've fallen, and so that's minus 0.4 times the multiplier of 2 gives us a plus 0.08. Um, my bet is that y will rise by 0.8 um, trillion per year. Um, and let's see if that's right. Yep, um, that's right. That's, at least that's what I calculated last night when I put this up. Um, 0.8 trillion per year. Um, these are the last um, of the big things we're going to have to calculate as far as the investment savings income expenditure model is concerned. Um, your ability to take this equation here and use it um, to answer questions. Uh, is one of the things I want you to most take away from this course. Um, now, for those of you who prefer graphs, um, for those of you who actually think the drawing of supply and demand graphs and economics courses and similar things is a great help to your understanding rather than a pointless ritual uh, that makes things more complicated because you not only have to get the right answer, you have to draw the right graph and label the parts correctly. Um, for those of you who like graphs, um, the right way to think about this graphically is to draw a graph where you have y, you know, aggregate demand, output, production, spending, income, it's all the same by the circular flow principle on the horizontal axis, um, and in which you have r, um, the interest rate that matters to businesses and foreign exchange speculators, the interest rate they really care about on the vertical axis. Um, and what is the level of spending in the economy going to be if their interest rate were down to zero? Um, well, then you would just have, um, if r were zero, um, then you just have your delta a zero plus delta g terms. Um, yeah. Which means that you would, when the r is zero, that you would hit the x-axis here. At this point where you have a zero divided by the multiplier terms plus your g divided by the multiplier terms, you calculate that. That tells you what the level of y is going to be when the long-term real risky interest rate r is zero. Um, and then if you have fiscal policy, these changes in G, um, changes in government purchases, if you expand government purchases, this curve will shift out to the right. If you contract them, this will shift into the left. The fact that the British government and the British conservative government has now embarked on a policy of contracting its government purchases is one thing that makes us um, very uneasy about the economic future of Britain, and which is why British Central Bank Chair Governor Mervyn King is right now doing all he can to try to drop interest rates down. Um, but aside from simply having this point here, for each percentage point, basis point, whatever the interest rate rises, um, you know, demand Y falls. Um, the higher the interest rate, the lower the level of spending in the economy, because both of the interest-sensitive terms, both gross exports and investment spending, they're negatively related to the interest rate. When the interest rate goes up, um, their values fall. Um, so if you don't know what the real interest rate is, but you do know all this other stuff, you can draw this red curve here, this red line here, and say this tells us what the relationship is between aggregate demand on the one hand and the interest rate on the economy as a whole. This is something you might well want to draw, um, even if I don't tell you to, if you're like graphs, in order to try to figure out how this investment savings complication for the income expenditure model works. Um, and then we're going to want to use um, this IS curve, right? That foreigners and confidence will pick out a point on the x-axis, and fiscal policy will then shift the IS curve left or right from that point on the x-axis. And monetary policy and financial markets will then tell you what the real interest rate is, and that will then pick out a point on this IS curve that will tell you what the level of spending income um, and spending in the economy is. Um, why do we call it IS? Um,